Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 95, A Sextet of Tudor Playwrights. Last time, the trauma of a divided kingdom took our attention and I hope showed what a very political and current piece the early blank verse tragedy Gorboduck was. But what were other playwrights of the time concerned with? In this episode, I'm going to tell you about several playwrights that we now think of as minor writers of the period, but who made significant contributions to the Elizabethan theatrical scene, some of whom directly influenced the playwrights who now overshadow them. Although biographical details are often rather lacking for these playwrights, and in many cases we only have a small selection of their work to base any judgments on, their lives and works do, I think, help to paint the picture of Elizabethan theatrical society, and they are an important inclusion into the overall story of the times. I have tackled my selection roughly chronologically rather than trying to apply any degree of significance to any one individual. I think, with one exception, you will probably not have come across these playwrights before, so I hope you enjoy hearing something of their life, times and works. George Gascoigne, born about 1535, was the son of a good family. He was educated at Cambridge University and attended the Middle Temple at the Inns of Court. Maybe. Much of his life story is conjecture, with the stories ranging from disinheritance by his father to becoming an MP, fighting in the Netherlands, being captured by the Spaniards and then released, and, maybe, being guilty of manslaughter. When he tried for a third year in Parliament, he was rejected as a defamed person and common ruffian. I think we can guarantee that he was a controversial figure, and it was a colourful life that wouldn't have been out of place for one of Lupe de Vega's plays of adventure and daring do, but the details are uncertain, and many may be a fictionalisation of some grain of truth. What we do know is that he was a second-tier published poet, and first to refer to the Queen in terms of a deity, so he was at least partly responsible for the cult of the Virgin Queen that became so popular. His works survive in a single published volume of poems, stories and plays, which was one of those publications that was originally made without the author's permission, but which he then returned to, corrected and authorised for a second edition. He's known to have translated two plays that were performed at the Inns of Court in 1566. One, a blank verse tragedy called Jocasta, which, at times, was touted as a direct translation from Euripides. This was certainly not the case, and it's more likely a translation from an Italian play. But from the theatre history perspective, his most notable contribution was The Supposes, a translation of Ariosto's E Suppositi. Significantly, this was a translation of the Italian verse into English prose, and as such, qualifies as the first English prose comedy. The original by Ariosto was a blending of plots from Plautus and Terence involving a young daughter married off to an old friend of her father's and a far more suitable young man being aided by a cunning servant who used a complex plan and startling coincidences to ensure that the lovers are in the end united. Gascoigne's other work often centred on courtly intrigues so his choice was an obvious one. Ariosto's original play remains more significant than this early English translation and adaptation as it turns up again in The Taming of the Shrew in 1593 and then in William Waverley's 1675 comedy The Country Wife. If I mention the name Robert Greene, it is his now infamous jibe at Shakespeare as an upstart crow that will come to mind. I'll get to that, but there is much more to Robert Greene than this apparent stab of jealousy at the upcoming bard. Greene was born in 1558 in Norwich and went to Cambridge University between 1573 and 1585. At least, we think that's the case. Unfortunately, the Christian name Robert and the surname Greene are two of the most common names of the period, so it's actually quite difficult to be certain of his origins and parentage. But this is the best we've got, so I'm going to go with the generally accepted version of his life. His time at Cambridge was quiet. Although there are records of theatricals performed there by his contemporaries, there is no mention of him and his academic results were no more than adequate. 
Yet somehow, he managed to change colleges at Cambridge, a very unusual occurrence at the time, and he spent time at Oxford too in an uncertain postgraduate capacity. So it seems that there was something special about him. There are stories about a good marriage, the squandering of a wife's dowry, and the abandonment of a wife and child as London called, or perhaps provided an anonymous refuge. Again, it's all very murky in the record. Despite the Oxford connection, he seems to have spent the majority of his time in London. He was always proud and boastful of his academic learning, but he soon became known as a boisterous man about town. A contemporary called him a feckless drunkard, who abandoned his wife and children and threw himself on the mercies of the tavern hostesses. Writing pamphlets and plays was supposedly a last resort when his credit failed, but it's always difficult to pick the truth out of these character statements. Who knows in what way Green might have offended the commentator, but in Green's case, nobody seems to have had a good word for him. Even when fellow playwright Thomas Nash came to his defence following an attack on Green by the satirist Gabriel Harvey, when he was called an inebriate and a debtor, Nash first has to agree with Harvey's assessment before adding the rather half-hearted and non-specific qualification that Green inherited more virtues than vices. There are some details of a period of European travel, but this too is doubted in spite of the fact that they come from an autobiographical pamphlet, one called The Repentance of Robert Green. There was always some doubt over the true authorship of this pamphlet, and analysis of the text suggests that it was indeed not written by Green at all, or at least not in a great part. It's a conundrum that we could easily get lost in, so I'll leave it there. We can fix onto his literary career with a bit more certainty. He penned 37 publications, which included plays, very popular illustrated romantic stories, and pious and moralistic pamphlets. His works sold well, with Nash claiming that printers were willing to pay dear for the very dregs of his wit. Shortly before he died, he issued a series of pamphlets concerning deathbed conversions and repentance, something that he then went on to perform as he lay ill. It all adds up to a sense that his actual life was in reality something between the extremes of the feckless drunkard and the champion of morality that the biography suggests, and that Green was probably trying to craft his story very carefully for public consumption. For all of that, he is credited with being the first truly professional English writer, in that he lived off his pen and he had no other income, sponsorship or family money to supplement his income. He said to have died of a surfeit of wine and pickled herrings, though it's more likely that he caught a dose of the plague given that he died in the middle of a severe outbreak in 1592. He wrote eight plays, prompted to take up the form, it is said, having seen Marlowe's Tamburlaine. He wrote Alphonsus of Aragon about 1589, which is in the same vein and heavily influenced by Tamburlaine. But Green was no Marlowe, and it is a comparatively weak effort. He then collaborated with Thomas Lodge, who gets another mention in a moment, on A Looking Glass for London and England. This is a more interesting piece from a historical point of view than his first attempt at theatre, because in its retelling of the biblical story of Jonah and the fall of Nineveh, it merges the traditions of the miracle play and the morality play with a style of raw satire that was appearing as playwrights became more confident in their craft and their place in society. Much of the play is concerned with the plight of the poor and the lowest in society, in comparison to the excesses of the wealthy. The title certainly shows that it was meant to be a commentary on contemporary England. Green took solo credit for the comedy Friar Bacon and Friar Bungie, written sometime between 1589 and 1594, which is generally considered to be his best play. Once again, he was certainly following Marlowe, both in the verse and the themes of the play, but some touches in the play are of Green's creation. His celebration of the English setting is heartfelt and unusual at a time when exotic settings were the rage. The celebration of the English people and the landscape comes through the character of Margaret, who embodies warm womanliness and the country girl, all English, as Green puts it. When Prince Edward, son of Henry III, sees her at work, he rather beautifully exclaims, 
Into the milk-house I went with the maid, and there amongst the cream bowls did she shine. She turned her smock over her lily arms, and dived them into the milk to run her cheese, but whither then the milk her crystal skin checked with lines of azure. It's a rather charming verse, coming from a playwright that we think of as a rather boisterous and cranky man. He also uses several plots that intertwine in the play, again, something that was unusual for the time. In the play, Prince Edward plans to seduce Margaret with the help of the dark arts administered by Friar Bacon, who is thought to be a satiric portrait of Francis Bacon. Just to hedge his bets, the friar also employs the more traditional talents of his friend Earl Lacey, whose sweet tones do indeed have the desired effect on Margaret, but in the process Lacey falls in love with her. Initially Edward is furious to learn of this outcome, but reconciles himself to it and returns to court where he falls in love with Eleanor of Castile, whom his father has selected for him, which is historically accurate in the selection and marriage, if not in the love. Margaret runs into trouble when she is subjected to the advances of two suitors who duel and kill each other. In a letter, Lacey tells her that he no longer loves her, and overcome by these events, she resolves to enter a nunnery. Just before she takes her vows, Lacey appears, and tells her that he was just testing her constancy, and that he still wants to marry her. She hesitates briefly, but then accepts him again. While this plot is running, we also see Friar Bacon using his magical powers. He enables the prince to see the blossoming romance between Margaret and Lacey through his magic glass. He interrupts their wedding from afar. He wins at a magic competition and magically transports people from one location to another. Working with Friar Bungie, he produces his greatest feat, the creation of a talking artificial head made of brass and animated by demonic influence that can surround England with a protective wall of the same metal. The spell is broken when Bacon falls asleep, something he has a habit of doing at odd times, and the head shatters as he drops it. His problems grow when he somewhat accidentally allows two students to witness their father's duelling in his magic glass. The students themselves then duel and kill each other like their fathers. Distraught at his part in this tragedy, Bacon renounces magic and turns to a life of repentance. His bad servant Miles, who is hunted by the devils that his master has called up, gets a promise of a job as a bartender in hell, and he rides to perdition on the devil's back. The fact that a sequel to this play was written is evidence of its popularity. John of Bordeaux, or the second part of Friar Bacon, has no author credit and was probably not written by Green. In James IV, written about 1593, Green turned more poetical in his telling of the near ruin of the Scottish king through his almost seduction by a court favourite. Having considered and rejected the idea of murdering his wife so that he can promote his favourite to Queen, the king realises the error of his ways and seeks repentance. Some of the action is told as a play within a play by Oberon and his troop of fairies, thereby allowing Green to flex his poetic muscles and scatter the dialogue with classical allusions. As with the country maid Margaret in Friar Bacon, it is the female roles that stand out as the most well-drawn and rounded characters, which again seems a bit odd coming from the man who, we are to believe, badly mistreated and abandoned his own wife. He also produced his own version of Orlando Furioso and was likely a collaborator in many other plays. Perhaps two more are his own work, but the attributions have been challenged on seemingly good grounds. The picture of Green as a working playwright and author, collaborating with others when necessary for inspiration or just to keep a more certain income rolling in, is perhaps the closest we can get to the truth of his life. And so to his comments on other playwrights. In a pamphlet published in 1592 called Green's Groat's Worth of Wit, he alludes to Shakespeare as an upstart crow beautified with our feathers. It is the first printed reference to Shakespeare, who at the time would have been a relatively recent arrival in London from Stratford, the new kid on the block. The implication is that Green objected to Shakespeare's borrowings from the works of more well-established playwrights. We tend to see this now as a rather pathetic jibe by a second-rate author, who failed to recognise genius when he saw it. 
Perhaps this is inevitable. It's on a par with the record executive who rejected the Beatles, thinking that beat groups were a passing fad, and the publishers who turned down Harry Potter, seeing its boarding school setting as rather outdated. But in its fuller form, which is more rarely given, the quote from Green is a bit more than that. For there is an upstart crow beautified with our feathers, that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you, and being an absolute Johannes factotum, and is in his own conceit the only shake scene in a country. The tiger's heart is a reference to Shakespeare's line O tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide, from Henry VI Part Three, which was probably the latest Shakespeare play at the time that Green was writing. So Green is showing that he knows the work, and he thinks an actor who writes plays cannot deserve the same or greater plays than those better university-educated playwrights who made up the core of what he thought was most exciting about the London theatre scene. He creates the word shake scene for an actor, a term that was never picked up or used again, as far as I can tell, and was probably using the Latin for Jack of All Trades, Johannes Factotum, as a play on the name of John Florio, or Johannes Florio, as this influential humanist thinker was known by his contemporaries. If this is correct, then typically of Green, this is a bit of a throwaway jibe where he tries to show off his own learning and shows off his skills at punning on scholarly matters, presumably aimed at his fellow university alumni, who may well have had some sympathy with his view of Shakespeare and his talents. Green died in 1592, if the biographical trail is correct, at just 34 years old, but he'd made his literary mark in his time, and his name was used on published work after his death, but clearly by the hand of others. So in his time, and just after, he had considerable fame and kudos. Now he is overshadowed by the great playwrights of his time, but at least some of his work deserves our attention for his eye for theatricality, some sharp and witty lines and a bold imagination. He was no Shakespeare and he was no Marlowe, but without the latter's lead, he may never have reached the heights that he did. But in spite of his short literary career, he left a significant mark on his time. Thomas Lodge, 1558-1625, was the son of a Lord Mayor of London and graduate of Trinity College, Oxford, who then attended at Lincoln's Inn, where he had a reputation as a prodigious talent. He wrote prose tracts from the age of 21, his opening salvo being a defence of poetry, music and stage plays. He joined up as a privateer, attempting to raid Spanish ships off the coast of Africa as they returned from the Spanish possessions in the New World, laden with gold and other treasures. It was an activity that had the approval, even the encouragement, of the Crown and was just one facet of the simmering tensions between Spain and England. He later joined a mission of exploration to South America. On those journeys, he found the time to hone his writing skills further and turned to prose romances and poetry. His Scalius Metamorphosis, written in 1589, is a verse fable in the style of Ovid, and some scholars argue that it was the inspiration for Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis, where the rhyme scheme and some occasional lines bear some striking similarities. He wrote two plays that we know of. The Wounds of Civil War, from 1594, is interesting as an early example of an English play with an ancient Roman setting and subject. In this case, the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic and particularly the struggle between the dictator Sulla and the popular consul Marius. And as I've already mentioned, he collaborated with Robert Greene on A Looking Glass for London and England. It seems that he did not trouble the stage again, but he did go on to write many prose and poetic works that reflect the different stages of his adventurous life, which included training as a physician and working as one in France. It wasn't only the undergraduates at the universities who had a stab at writing plays. Thomas Preston is thought to have written at least ten plays while he was a fellow at King's College, Cambridge, then Master at Trinity College and then Vice-Chancellor of the University for a short time. He wrote in just about every genre going from tragedy to farce, 
from rustic comedy to historical chronicle, and sometimes mixed genres within the same play. His style was grandiose and bombastic, so much so that he was often criticised and parodied by other writers. His Containing the Life of Cambyses, King of Persia, is thought to be the basis of the Shakespearean allusion in Henry IV Part I, when Falstaff says, Give me a cup of sack to make my eyes look red, that it may be thought that I had wept, for I must speak in passion, and I will do so in King Cambyses' vein. Which, with the parodies and other references, speaks to the fact that this and probably Preston's other plays were popular with the public, and well known enough for such references to be understood. Cambyses, if we can take that as typical of his work, is full of death, gore, beheadings, even a flailing, and such violence being an audience favourite with the Elizabethans and well into the next century too. I've already mentioned that collaboration was common amongst the Tudor playwrights, and perhaps the most extreme example that we can track is The Tragedy of Tancared and Gismund. It was written in 1567 and is mainly credited to Robert Wilmot. But of the five acts, Act 2 is by Henry Noel and Act 4 is by Sir Henry Hatton. The plot of the play is taken from a story by Boccaccio and is a chivalric story of illicit love resulting in murder and suicide. George Peel was a Londoner through and through. His father had written scripts for city pageants that were put on at regular intervals and, of all things, books on methods of accounting. His son had even more literary flair and, after his time at Oxford University, returned to London in 1581 with the reputation of something of a bohemian. He was an associate of Robert Greene and the University Wits set, which was a contemporary term that grouped together the university-educated writers, playwrights and poets who were based in London and used it as their playground. Peel, like his friends, wrote prose, plays and poetry. And in his case, he also continued the family tradition of creating scripts for the city pageants. Most of his poetry was on a for-hire or speculative basis. Poems in praise of whoever had paid the fee, or was likely to contribute to his funds on receipt of a flattering but unsolicited verse. He apparently did well and spent his income freely on all of the pleasures that the City of London could provide. It's also mentioned that he worked as an actor and was a great prankster, leaving none of his friends safe from his mischievous humour. Five of his verse plays have survived and show that he could be tender and thoughtful when required. The Arraignment of Paris, a court mask from 1584, is thought of as being particularly lyrical and graceful. It was performed for the court, and Elizabeth no doubt appreciated the flattery of being described as fairer than the famously beautiful goddesses that Paris was forced to rate. His history play Edward I is passed over by scholars as hardly worthy of mention. Scarcely authentic history is the general opinion. But the Battle of Alcazar from 1588 is mostly more kindly regarded. Although overly romantic and showing signs of the long influence of Marlowe's Tamburlaine, it sets a story of intrigues, double agents and daring do against the naval battles between Portugal and Morocco that had occurred ten years earlier. Peel was no doubt jumping on the wave of national pride in the English Navy that followed the recent success against the Spanish Armada in May that year. His later prose play, Old Wives' Tale, is now thought of as his best effort. Written in 1592, it opens in a realistic, rustic setting, with the old wife of the title struggling to find the words to relate her story, but then turns romantic and fabulous, close to what we might call magical realism now, as players appear and perform her tale. It mixes the romantic story with song and dance and elements of magic, a brave knight and a ghost, so really plays on some of the most popular theatrical elements of the time, and some of the poetry at least is very good. The play is ambiguous and open to several interpretations, so it's seen either as simply a whimsical comedy, the first of its kind on the English stage, or as a parody of much that was being presented on the stage at the time. Some even consider it somewhat mystical, with the whole thing being an enactment of what's going on in the old lady's mind. Quite a strange piece indeed. John Lilly was a very different character to Peel. 
He was born, about 1554, into the Elizabethan establishment, his grandfather being the famous Greek and Latin scholar William Lilly, who authored Lilly's Grammar, a work on Latin syntax that was prescribed for school use by Henry VIII and would be influential on English grammatical studies until the 19th century. Although John never reached his grandfather's exalted position, he had a good academic career at both Cambridge and Oxford and produced two pastoral prose romances in 1578 and 1580 that were particularly appreciated for the elegance of the language both in the conversations of the characters and the descriptive passages. And everyone thought that Lily was set for a glittering literary career. Certainly somewhat due to the success of these two plays and the reputation he gained from them, Lily was appointed assistant master at St Paul's School, a role that included the management of the troop of boy actors associated with the school. With the Queen being a regular attendee at performances given by the boys, Lily developed both an interest in writing plays and a significant way into the court circle. He was soon appointed to a position in the Revel's office, responsible for the court entertainments. Lily's plays were written specifically for this semi-professional group of boy actors and it is perhaps no surprise that with boys playing girls' parts there is a distinct theme of cross-dressing in his plays. We see this elsewhere, of course, not least in Shakespeare's comedies, but also much used by other dramatists for the adult companies too. The combination of working with the boy troops and for the court gives this element a particular prominence in Lily's work, and this is not just from the effeminate or androgynous young boys. The Queen was famously virgin and credited with a male intellect, enabling her to fulfil the role that was still seen by most, despite her successes, as inherently male. Her rather masculine characteristics were only further held in contrast against her court, that was filled with many there, particularly the beautiful, gilded youth of the aristocracy, spending a rather frivolous life in her orbit. Lily's plays are seen as delicate, witty and charming, but also rather artificial and cool, with their sometimes forced philosophical allusions and political commentary. Like the other university-educated playwrights, he loved to show off his learning, but as he was working for the closed and very specific circle of the court, and tailored his work for that, he was never likely to break into the mainstream of popular theatre. His first comedy, Alexander and Campaspe, written in 1580, takes the classical setting of the love triangle between the all-powerful Alexander, Campaspe of Thebes, his prisoner, and Apelles, a portrait artist. When Alexander is captivated by Campaspe's beauty, he frees her and orders Apelles to paint her portrait. Model and artist fall in love, and to prolong their meetings, Apelles continually destroys his work in progress. Alexander is suspicious and tricks Apelles into revealing the lover's plan. In a moment of introspection, he realises how foolish he has been, saying, It were a shame that Alexander could desire to command the world if he cannot command himself. He allows both artist and model to depart to pursue their life together. Lily often played with placing opposing views and ideas close together in his texts and managed to craft delicate arguments and questions for his audience to consider through his clever use of language. But that resulted in unrealistic characterisation. When the servant Manners complains about his situation, he says to his fellow servant Silas, I serve instead of a master a mouse, whose house is a tub, whose dinner is a crust, and whose bed is a board. Silas replies, Then art thou in a state of life which philosophers commend, crumb for thy supper, a hand for thy cup, and thy clothes for thy sheets, for natura porsis contenta. All very erudite and syntactically balanced, but hardly a chat of two servants having a moan about their master's shortcomings. This play was also intended to praise Elizabeth, casting her in an Alexandrian light, where the great conqueror still understands the place of art and love. Sappho and Phaon follows the same themes and praises a powerful but benign queen. Endymion, the man in the moon, concerns a youthful suitor in pursuit of Cynthia, the virgin lunar goddess. It was written about 1585, so we can assume that the allusion is to the Duke of Alenson or the Earl of Leicester, both potential suitors for the queen who is represented by the moon goddess. <laughs> 
always one, yet never the same, still inconsistent, yet never wavering. Lily had hopes of being appointed Master of the Revels Office and pursued this quite relentlessly, but there was something about him that Elizabeth disliked and she always refused his petitions. His later works subtly reflect his disappointment. Midas, from 1589, and The Woman in the Moon, written sometime around 1591, are more critical and cynical. He stayed in court circles and quite likely still wrote masks and plays for the boys until he died in 1606, reportedly an embittered man. We don't remember much of his plays now because they are so specifically dedicated to the court audience and the performance skills of the boys, but he is not without influence. He helped to create English as the language for comedy and others, including Shakespeare and Marlowe, learned from his work. Many of his contemporaries held his elegant diction in great regard, some would say far too much so, which means that his voice can be heard in plays like Peel's Arraignment of Paris and Shakespeare's early plays, particularly in Love's Labour's Lost. One could say that it was a misfortune for these dramatists to be born into and live in the shadow of other greater talents. As in many walks of life, dramatists are judged against their contemporaries, and all of those I've talked about in this episode could not lift themselves to stand beside Shakespeare, Marlowe, Johnson and others in the long term. But that is from a historical perspective. In their time, they were well known and in some cases greatly admired and popular. If we're looking at the complete theatrical scene for the period, then these playwrights absolutely form an important part of that story and serve as a reminder that the Elizabethan world was alive with new ideas and approaches to theatre that were rooted in a life experience of men like these. And Shakespeare had to fight for his place amongst them, just like any other jobbing playwright. Each of these playwrights typify aspects of the Elizabethan playwright, who we can characterise as educated, widely read, creative and imaginative. We might also call them religious and complentative, but at the same time, there's a sense that life was boisterous, wild and often dangerous, even for those who stayed in London and did not seek out adventure abroad. These playwrights lived an Elizabethan life, a life of high culture but low pleasures, of risk and some brutality. Next time, I'll be looking at a playwright who is better known for his commentary on other playwrights rather than his own work, but another significant figure of the time that's now rather overshadowed. At the centre of that group of university wits was a man who was watching them all, Thomas Nash. In the meantime, please join the Facebook page or group or find us on Instagram or Twitter to keep up to date with the podcast and other theatre-related stuff. If you'd like to help support the podcast, the easiest thing would be to pass on the word to anyone you think might be interested in a bit of theatre history. Or, if you have a moment, write a review and rate the podcast in your podcast app of choice. You can find details of other ways to support the podcast at the website at www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. There's also additional content on Patreon that you can access for a small monthly fee. You can also find details of that on the website and there's a link in the show notes. I look forward to your company next time, but if you do have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. (laughs) 